May I start uh, with a land acknowledgement? I want to uh, acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territory of several Indigenous nations. And this is sacred, uh, a sacred gathering place for many Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And recognizing the long history and the contributions of First Nations, Métis and Inuit is paramount. And I want to give special acknowledgement to the Mississaugas of New Credit. I'd like to just add that I'm dialing in today from Kamloops, BC on the unceded and traditional territory of the Shishwetmik people. Thank you. Well, Nicole, uh, I'm so thrilled that uh, I get a chance to have this conversation with you. And, um, and earlier this week, I announced uh, this really terrific trade arrangement with a number of countries around the world, including New Zealand and Australia, Chinese Taipei, uh, which really will help further Indigenous peoples and trade uh, of Indigenous peoples. I said at that time that, um, that Indigenous peoples are the first traders in Canada. You're the first entrepreneurs in Canada. And today, uh, the work that we get to do in this journey together so that Indigenous uh, people and entrepreneurs can yield the benefits of globalized trade is just so incredibly um, uh, exciting. And we are also right now um, in Indigenous um, History Month. So it's a time of, um, of opportunity to, uh, to share and um, and to use this time this month to uh, to storytell, and um, and of course when I made the announcement earlier this week, I actually talked about you, Nicole, and I talked about your incredible company, and I often say you need to see her to be her, and boy are you <laughs> some her, um, and so maybe we'll just start there, which is like tell us about. Raymond Reeds, tell us about the company. How did you get started? And uh, how did this come to be? Yeah, thank you so much. So my story is very non-linear. So I actually, uh, I'm from British Columbia, but I went to university at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And I actually started my career as a geologist. So I was working in the far north of Saskatchewan, doing prospecting, uh, living in tent camps in the summer and the winter time. And then I slowly got into more policy work and, and working in the office. So I spent almost 16 years uh, in the natural resource industry. But it was through that work that I started to get into um, relationships with other Indigenous communities. It was around that time I learned more about my Métis heritage and my own family's roots in Saskatchewan. So by the time uh, around 2015, and we're coming out on the tail end of the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report and the calls to action, I was looking for creative ways to engage my coworkers in the process and the journey of reconciliation. But in a, in a way that was, was easy for people to slide into and, and is something that they could do in their own personal time. So I had started a book club at our workplace and we focused exclusively on books written by Indigenous authors. And it was there that I saw how meaningful and how impactful just reading a really great story helped get the message across in terms of why we care about what happened in the past, but also how that continues to have a ripple effect in today's society. So I saw an opportunity to not only get great literature to Canadians, but also to pair that with Indigenous products that were sourced from Indigenous entrepreneurs. That is really, really terrific. Um, when I was reading um, uh, your story of how, um, you know, of how Raven Reads came to be, because what, uh, what was shared with me was uh, here is this terrific Indigenous female entrepreneur. She started this business out of this, um, uh, this, uh, wonderful, um, uh, this wonderful need to share about the history of uh, Indigenous peoples and, uh, and and to help others learn about that, and then turn it into this entrepreneurial venture. And you started in your basement, is that right? <laughs> yeah, we were folding, uh, putting together boxes in our basement with my husband and my daughter, who was about seven years old at the time. She stuck the stickers on. 
<laughs> well, um, and uh, and I hear that uh, you know that that you really sort of took a look at uh, at. Um, how subscription boxes uh, were put together, what your competitors were like, and uh, and and you started with twenty, and then it immediately really grew. And then I think you um, you also sort of uh, asked yourself, I don't think that it can just you know I don't think it needs to just be a side hustle. There is something here, and maybe you could take what was a uh, you know a bit of a startup a side hustle in your basement on a passion project and make it a business and only a business that you are uh, that you are where customers are in Canada but you started to look elsewhere you started to look in the international market so talk to me a little bit because uh, you know as Canada's international trade minister and small business minister my job is to help businesses start up in Canada scale up it could be in Canada, but it could be internationally and to access those international markets. And I know that a lot of the, you know, a lot of people here, whether they're entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs or businesses already who are in Canada are interested about that journey because for a small business, it's actually not always, people always wonder how to do it. And they always think that it's really difficult to do that. And I know that uh, you've, you know, you've, you've used the trade accelerator program. And I think people are just interested to hear your journey of how it went from where it was to where it is today and tell mm -hmm. people is today. Yeah, so we quickly scaled from 20 boxes and then we jumped to 200 and then we were around 700 and now we're up in the, in the thousands. And, you know, when I started, I was really focused on Canada because we were just, you know, beginning this, this formal process of reconciliation. But as I started to discover, you know, there's there's Canadians living abroad. There are, you know, there's Indigenous people, obviously, around the world. And there's people around the world that are looking to go on a similar journey. And so we naturally were thinking uh, the U.S. to start with because it's it's a similar type of market and, and it's a little easier to, to enter for business there. And when I... When I started to get into the TAP program and, and explore the different resources that were out there, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I did not have a formal plan. Um, and I kind of had to go through some of these programs and let it marinate a bit before I really was committed to, uh, to going into these new markets. But once I started to hear that there was, you know, specific states in the U.S. that had markets larger than Canada as a whole, I said, this is just silly if I don't at least begin to explore how we can bring this exact product or a slight variation of this product into other countries like the US and see if it can help us grow our business and become more of a global brand than, than just a, a Canadian brand. So we did go through the TAP program uh, in Vancouver. We also have gone through the Can Export and have received excellent uh, support through there. So we've taken about two years to prepare um, we, we're not able to trademark Raven Reads in Canada, so it took some time to come up with a new brand for the U.S. and change some of our nomenclature a bit to prepare for that market entry. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, the journey for small businesses looking uh, beyond the Canadian market is such an important one. Um, I often talk about um, Canada being enviable in some, res well, in many respects, because we really have access to a billion and a half customers in the world through our existing trade agreements. So we have them in the North America, in North America, through our agreement with um, Mexico and United States. We have it in Europe through CETA. We also have um, a really great agreement with uh, the Asia Pacific through CPTPP. So countries like Japan and Australia and New Zealand and Singapore, but also a number of bilateral agreements as well with, you know, with Korea, with Israel, and we're at the negotiating table with countries like India, as well as the ASEAN, which includes a number of other uh, Asian markets that include Philippines and Thailand, for example, we're at the table with Indonesia. So part of the job is, as the trade minister, is to open up these markets, but actually create like free trade agreements so that they provide the um, the the framework for businesses to do business. So things like your certification or uh, licensing or liability insurance, as you said, your you know your trademark, uh, international accounting or logistics, all of these things are things that. Uh, that that businesses need to 
kind of get their head around in terms of how to grow into those markets. But it is infinitely, infinitely doable. And it's sort mm -hmm. of what I call Canada's trade toolkit as well. Like we want to be here, like if I'm going to be successful, it is because you are successful. Yours and, and businesses are successful. So, um, you know, as I said earlier, when I started uh, this conversation, earlier in the week, we signed on an arrangement, a um, Indigenous people's uh, trade and economic arrangement with a number of countries with partners. And here, it really is about um, creating opportunities uh, by Indigenous peoples, for Indigenous peoples. So I would love to sort of just hear uh, from your standpoint, kind of um, what do you see as a bit of that future for your company? Where would you like to see that growth? And and if you're talking, you know, and, and think about it from the standpoint of those that are here are, are, are wondering, can I do this? And they're looking at someone who actually is not only doing it, um, sharing that journey. So help you know, share a bit of that with, uh, with, with our audience. Yeah. So, you know, one of the big things that I've noticed in the last little while is ensuring that where we're putting our efforts and where those, uh, where the capital is existing for investing in business is aligned with where indigenous people are tending to go for business. And so the more understanding we can have of where, um, you know, what markets and what sectors indigenous peoples and entrepreneurs tend to find themselves based on their passion is aligning with the industries that we're really pushing and where the capital tends to be going. Uh, because I find sometimes there can be a bit of a disconnect. As a new entrepreneur, you know, thinking through where are there opportunities, not only in terms of, you know, if you have a product you like, and we tend to kind of drift towards consumer products quite a bit, because we start usually with what can I make myself and what do I enjoy making but also taking a look at what's out there where are there vacuums where there's no indigenous representation where we could really kind of go into and and make a huge impact so um, you know creating more role models in other industries beyond the consumer goods and whether that's that's tech or aerospace and other places and also those industries that are aligned with the trade agreements that you are out negotiating yeah, that's um, that's really uh, good and uh, and sound advice. I mean, when I think about some of the work that we are also doing here in Canada to um, to support Indigenous entrepreneurs and businesses, it is collaborating with uh, the Canadian Council for uh, for you know for uh, Aboriginal uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. It is uh, working with the various uh, AFIs across the country so that that access to capital, but also that mentorship and that sort of that assistance is provided in such a way that, you know, that really uh, encourages and supports the greatest success for Indigenous entrepreneurs. And maybe on that front, um, you know, can you sort of speak to, um, you know, an Indigenous entrepreneur who is looking to uh, either start or or get on that growth journey. I mean, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is looking at markets and sectors, I mean, you know, from an Indigenous uh, business standpoint, what kind of advice would you give that entrepreneur, um, that business owner as they are looking to grow their business or start their business? My biggest piece of advice is think big. So think further down the road and think, if I'm going to be insanely successful, what does that look like? So you may start with a simple product, whether that's a bar of soap or a piece of jewelry or a food or a beverage product, but think bigger because if that opportunity comes knocking, you want to be ready to take it, embrace it and run with it. So not only do you want to be thinking about that long-term plan and what that could could grow into is creating something scalable because we often have these businesses that are great ideas and they work well at a local community level. But if you suddenly get an opportunity that comes along, having something that's ready to scale and ready to pursue some of those opportunities will just make it so much smoother and, and just so less intimidating when it does come along. That is absolutely terrific advice. Um, and, uh, and I love the way you think. 
which is to think big. And I couldn't agree more. Um, I often say to small businesses, uh, you talked about the Can Export Program. And as part of the Can Export Program, there is, I mean, you know, it provides, uh, you know, access to funding for things like if you want to go to a trade show, if you want to, uh, you know, sort of deal with licensing and so forth. It gives you sort of some of that funding to do that. But you know what it also give it also provides for? It provides for IP, IP advice and securing your IP. Why is that important? I have talked to businesses in the same way that you have, Nicole, which is to say, think big and think about that scalability and the fact that you can and you should. And, you know, and back to IP for a second, I say, you know, you may be starting a small business in your community and it might be small, but you've got to say, my company is going to be a hundred, a hundred million dollar company. What am I going to do when it's a hundred million dollars? What are the things I've done now? to make sure that when my company is that $100 million company, I, I buttoned it down, right? And, um, and, and I think that that is what, uh, I, you know, I, I think that is what you're saying, uh, which is don't be afraid to think big. And I would echo that as, uh, you know, as the person who uh, works together with uh, many businesses across this country to listen to what those needs are, and then to try to match up what it is that we could be doing um, as a federal government in partnership so that we could really support that success. And that scalability is absolutely right. Um, Nicole, you said earlier that as you were looking at markets in the U.S., that some of those markets in even one state is bigger than all of Canada. Well, I say that too. I say, look, I mean, Canada's 37 million people. We're like the size of California. So there are markets out there and there are markets for you to pursue. So that scalability is really important because, um, because uh, the trade agreements that we are entering into, you're talking about economies with, with a lot more people, with a lot more customers. So thinking about that right from the get-go is, really, uh, is, is really important. Now, I've also read that some of the work you are doing um, in terms of giving back to the, you know, to Indigenous community in terms of looking at, you know, kind of within your own value chain, you're looking at how you can, how you, your business is contributing to that value chain of other Indigenous businesses that might come into your value chain. And there's another female entrepreneur, which, uh, you know, which I know you're working with, uh, that is very deliberately, you very deliberately said, we're going to collaborate because I want that into into my business supply chain, my value chain. Talk a little bit about that because I think that contribution is incredibly important as well. Yeah, so, you know, we've been around for four and a half years and a lot of that work was, you know, obviously purchasing goods from other Indigenous entrepreneurs to feature in our boxes. And it's been through that work that we've identified a number of gaps in services that are out there, but we also saw opportunities uh, of working together because the biggest challenge we face is being able to scale. And in order for a lot of our business models to be successful, we need that scale. And Canada is a, is a large country, as you know, and transportation and movement of goods can get expensive. And in order to be competitive, not only nationally, but internationally, we need to be able to access uh, rates for things that get where we have those economies of scale to, to, to see that growth. So we're looking at ways that we can begin offering services and enhance some of our coaching services where we can start working together to achieve some of those economies of scale that's really going to improve the competitiveness of not only Raven Reads, both in Canada and the U.S., but also all of our suppliers that we work with. Yeah, that is so terrific. And, um, and um, I love... I mean, I love your whole ethos, I mean, in terms of how you started the business and how you're growing the business and the incredible ambitious, uh, you know, the ambition of thinking big. I often uh, say this, you need to see her to be her. And, uh, you know, where I started was, you know, like you are some her. And uh, and it's terrific uh, because uh, that uh, that young Indigenous girl is going to look and say, yeah, that Nicole, I can be that Nicole. Um, and, and um in the spirit of um, celebrating Indigenous History Month, and given what Raven Reads does, maybe you can share in sort of parting thoughts uh, two books that you think every Canadian should be reading this month to help um, to help understand that journey and uh, and and to celebrate. Sure. 
So I have two. One mm -hmm. is a little heavy hitting, but it is incredibly important, I think, for all Canadians to read. And it's called The Break by Katharina Vermette. And this book was the Kickstarter of our book club. And it's the one that really kind of turned the light bulb on for me to see, ah, this story gets the message across. So mm -hmm. I strongly recommend The Break by Katharina Vermette. And then on a more lighter, entertaining, and just feel-good story, I highly recommend Birdie by Tracy Lindbergh. And that's a story about a Cree woman from northern Alberta that's looking to escape unhealthy relationships by moving to Gibson's, B.C. to find a uh, fictional character from a show some of us may remember called Beachcombers. And it's a light take on finding, uh, finding love. So I highly recommend those two. Well, that is absolutely terrific. And uh, if my folks here on my social team is listening, we are going to tag both of those incredible authors and books um, as you know, here so that uh, so that everyone who is uh, watching this will have uh, will have that information. And I'm going to um, you're based out of British Columbia, I will be there next week. I am very much looking forward to doing this, but you and I are going to be able to do it in person and, uh, and bravo, we get to do this in person. Um, <laughs> finally. So, um, I want to thank you so very much for this wonderful conversation and, um, and to all of those who joined us today, I hope you are taking away from this, uh, this, incredible journey uh, from a terrific female Indigenous entrepreneur and leader. And, uh, and it is exactly, I mean, you epitomize the, um, the work that I do. I couldn't describe my work better than just simply having you here to say, this is what, you know, this is how you've started your business and this is how you're growing the business and this is how the business is going international. So thank you so, so very much for that, Nicole. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you today and share our story. We'll see you Indeed. next week. <laughs> see you next week. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.